So a movie came out decades ago about these two guys. They were brothers, and they're just kind of going aimlessly through life, a little bit crazy. And in the movie, they find themselves with a call, and they're on a mission from God. Anybody know the movie? Blues Brothers. Classic movie about these two guys who are just kind of off, running wild, doing their own thing. But in the movie, they get this calling, this high calling, and all of a sudden, they're on a mission from God. Everything they do has to do with this mission. Every direction they go has to do with this mission because they're on not just any mission, but a mission from God. And I don't know if you've ever had that kind of experience where you knew God either was pulling you to do something or kind of had challenged you. For me, it happened at about 16 years old, from 16 to 18. I knew what God had really stirred in me was life change. And I can't pinpoint, I I know I was on a walk at my grandparents' house and and I knew when God started stirring it in me, uh, but it was this idea of life changing people. It wasn't to be a pastor, it wasn't necessarily within a church But the ultimate life change is a relationship with Jesus. Some people don't always get all the way there. So then what does life change look like? Sometimes it's it's seeing people go from step one to step two, step two to step five. And and in the big picture, are they better off because they met me? Have they seen God at work in my words and my attitudes? I knew that was part of my mission. And for you, maybe you've been in that place where you knew God had called you or or tugged on your heart or, or gifted you or all of the above toward a specific mission for your life. As a church, we have a mission, and it really is summed up in three words, loving, maturing, and reaching. And over these next three weeks, we're going to be diving into each of these words, looking at perspectives scripturally, and then practically of how do we live this out. And the goal of the mission is to accomplish the vision. The mission should point us in the direction of the vision. If there are are any Mission Impossible fans in the room, you know that the charge that that the, the guy would get would say, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to accomplish, and then it would say what it was, and then this message will self-destruct in how many seconds? But the goal of the mission is to accomplish the vision. We rolled the vision out about two weeks ago. Uh, Bill highlighted again last week, and I'd like us to read it together again. It'll be up on the screens. And can we read this as a congregation? It says, Spring Lake Church, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will develop and equip tens of thousands of people to be Christ followers and disciple makers, resulting in an enduring legacy of God's love in northeastern Wisconsin and the world. Now, maybe you're new to Spring Lake. Maybe you're still checking things out or you're a first-time guest with us today. This is a great time to get on board because you're going to hear really what we believe God has called us to be about and what our mission is. Now, as we look at loving, maturing, and reaching, what I want to do this weekend is start with the first word in that statement, and that is loving. Would you please turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, page 731 in the Bibles and the seatbacks. As you hear the mission, I want you to know this isn't just something that's cliche and is going to change. We've actually staffed by the mission. We set our goals by the mission, our calendar by the mission. Even our services have loving, maturing, and reaching involved in each weekend service. So we do take this seriously. Now, as we dive into the passage, let me give you a little background. Jesus has started making a name for himself. He started becoming a hot commodity in this region. His teachings are not like any other religious leader. He's not like your average preacher. All of a sudden, people are hearing him going, there's something different about the way he talks. How does he have such authority? Not only that, but not the teachings are followed by miracles. We see that where Jesus leaves, there are people telling accounts of of what they were and what they are now and and how their lives have been totally turned on its head. One of the leading Pharisees hears about this and decides to invite Jesus over for dinner. And that's where we'll pick up reading. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 36, page 731 in the Bibles and the seatbacks. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman, we don't even get a name, all we know is it's a woman. A woman 
in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now I want you to freeze the picture right there. We're going to come back to this passage, but let's jump in a little bit. So they're having a dinner, and I've illustrated this before, but But the way they ate back then wasn't at a table where you pull up a chair and your food is in front of you. Everything was laid out on a floor or a very low table. So they would sit with their feet behind them. You never put your feet near your food. So they sit with with their feet behind them and eat with one hand, sometimes leaning on an arm, but eating with the right hand. And this woman would have come in from behind Jesus to reach his feet. Now, my guess is Jesus may not have seen her coming, but the look on the Pharisee's face would have told him that something was going on. This woman is walking into a men's club. Not only that, she is a woman who is a sinner, more than likely, most likely, a prostitute, who walks into the house of a very religious man and begins kneeling down, weeping, and washing Jesus' feet with her own hair. Now, what a contrast in picture. So you will, as we continue on the passage in a minute, you'll see the Pharisee invites Jesus in, never offers him oil, which in this environment, in the Middle East, they, they would use oil as a lotion because the air was so dry and they would walk long distances. He never offers him oil. and never offers him water to wash his feet. And yet, in contrast, this woman is at Jesus' feet. The Pharisees wanted to get right to business. This woman wanted to know Jesus to the point she was willing to be at his dirty, nasty, stinky feet. And you're going, oh, those are Jesus' feet. (laughs) Yep, but you put any pair of feet on a dirty road and get them sweaty, and I promise you, they stunk. (laughs) So we see this woman at Christ's feet, and in this picture, we see worship, we see love, we see submission, we see genuine surrender, humility. And it's also a picture of intimacy. And this is the word I want to focus on today. Intimacy. See, we talk about loving. In our culture, let's be real, we say we love everything. We love our favorite sports team. We love our favorite food. We love our wife. We love our kids. We love our bicycle. But at this point, this woman goes from a a hang-loose, relational, kind of nice word of loving to a place of intimacy and intimacy is different the synonyms for intimacy are closeness familiarity warmth affection and yes sex is a part of that our culture usually goes straight to the sex side but let me give you a little cleaner a little purer example of intimacy how many of you have babies can I see a show of hands okay some of you how many of you have ever had a baby can I see a show of hands? how many of you know someone who had a baby how many of you know what a baby is Okay, good. I think we're all in the room now. So there's, this, there's babies, and, and babies are just like happy and fun. When you get a baby that's joyful and the arms are going like crazy and their feet are kicking and their little chubby cheeks are going in all different directions out of control, and they squeal with joy. Last night, uh, Ryan and Jenny, our, our youth pastor, they had their baby in the lobby, and all you'd hear echoing through the lobby was, ah, just excited with all the people coming up. And when it's a happy baby, everybody wants the baby. Can I hold the baby? You rock the baby. And I don't care who you are. You talk gibberish the minute a baby is in your arms. You will make faces. You'll change your voice until you start seeing that look of concern on the baby's face. (laughs) A little whine, a little complaint. And all of a sudden, the sweat starts on your head. You don't want to be the person that babies don't like. So you try harder to get the baby happy. The baby goes to tier two and then tier three on the cry meter. Tier three, we used to call the goat cry because it's no longer a cry. Now it's like, ah, 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 that baby is mad. <laughs> that baby is now no longer a cute, innocent little child. It is toxic. And you're just looking. Who do you go looking for? Mom and dad. Specifically, probably mom. Why? Because there's an intimate relationship between baby and parent. 
parent will know why the baby is crying. It could be a wet diaper. It could be hungry. It could be they lost their pacifier. They could be tired. It could be gas. You don't know what it is, but mom or dad will know. When a mom feeds a baby, even when a dad with a bottle, they say a baby can see the most I've ever seen is two feet from its own face. So when a mom holds a baby and, and feeds it or a dad feeds it, it's the closest that a baby gets. It's the face that that child will know early and often. When a mother carries that baby, it's a place of intimacy. I don't think you can get any closer in relationship than a mom carrying a child. Another picture is that child grows up. Have you ever been maybe in our own lobby or in the mall? And you're standing there and a little child will walk up to you thinking you're the parent and grab your leg. Now for us, the grabby, it's awkward. For that child... It's absolutely horrifying. <laughs> they are grabbing onto you as a place of safety, security, someone who knows them, someone who loves them, and they look up and all of a sudden they are filled with fear. You're not the one I trust. You're not the one who loves me and provides for me. You're not the one who's there for me. They're looking for the one that they know, the place of intimacy. See, innocence will cling to intimacy. There's nothing to hide. There's no reason not to trust. Innocence clings to intimacy, but a jaded or hurt or cynical heart will push intimacy away. It keeps people at a distance. It doesn't always know how to deal with intimacy. When there's a lack of intimacy or an unwillingness for intimacy, what it's saying is there's nothing special between us. There's no connection between us. Let's be buds. What's this look like with God? I'm down here. You're up there. If I need you, I'll call you. God wants more than that with us. He's looking for and wants intimacy. When we talk about loving and worship and prayer, he wants that to be places of intimacy, of relationship with us. Here's some things we need to know about NFC, and here's the first two blanks on your outline. The first one is this. God knows you intimately. He knows you intimately. He knows me intimately. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah writes, before I formed you, this is God speaking, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Before I was a thought, before I was a twinkle in my daddy's eye, God knew who I was going to be. God knew what I would like, what I wouldn't like. He knew my quirks. He knew my mannerisms. He knew my strengths and my weaknesses. He knew the buttons to push. He knew the things to take away that may cause me to go, God, where are you? But in reality, he's saying, I'm right here. Lean into me. Get to know me. God knows you intimately. I want to read. Psalm 139, 1 through 14. I just want you to listen to this passage as David writes about his relationship with God. David writes, he says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Verse 23, David says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God knows us intimately. Another word used here in intimacy is the same word in, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, where it says that Adam knew Eve and they bore children. It's not about the act. It's about the relationship. And the word here for knowing, this relational knowing, this intimacy in the Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, is yada, Y-A-D-A, -A. yada. As one Hebrew scholar put, it's a mingling of the souls. It's a relationship that's so tight, it's not that I do this and you do that, it's we do all of this together. It's a mingling of the souls. Our relationship with Christ, just as a relationship with a spouse, isn't supposed to be a weekend fling. 
It's an ongoing relationship. When you are married for any amount of time, five years, 10 years, 20, 30, some of you have been married 40 years. Bless your hearts. The longer you're married, the more you get to know each other. The more intimate the relationship is. And you get to know each other so well, you don't need to say a word. If your spouse goes, <clears throat> you know exactly what that means. If they cross their arms, you know what that means. If they shift in their chair a certain way, you know exactly what that means. If they start nodding, everyone else thinks they're agreeing, you know what that means. If they raise one eyebrow, you know what that means. If they raise the other eyebrow, it means something different, and you know the difference. There's relationship, there's intimacy, there's yada. And it's what God wants not just with us to have with each other, but what he wants us to have with him. And I'll tell you this, the longer you're in relationship, the closer the intimacy can grow. As Gina and I celebrated 25 years of being married, we're still married, as we, as we celebrate 25 years of marriage though, our, our level of yadav, of intimacy, of knowing each other is far closer than it ever could have been in year two. Intimacy, relationship, closeness. When it comes to Christ, we can have this intimacy or we can come up with a hundred excuses why we won't. We can keep them at a safe distance. We can talk about how awkward it is. We can say how it's invasive or we can have the relationship he wants us to have with him. That's the first one and God knows us intimately. Secondly, God wants us to know him intimately. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23 and 24 it says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight. He not only knows us, he wants us to know him. He wants a mingling of our souls. And this sounds cool, doesn't it? It sounds like something poetic. The creator of the universe and I have mingled souls. It is anything but cool. It is actually annoying sometimes and uncomfortable. You see, when Jesus says this, he doesn't want to be your best friend at a distance. This isn't a texting, tweeting relationship. This is someone who wants to get inside and pop your personal bubble. Have any of you had that friend who had no clue what personal space was? That friend that if you didn't keep backing up when they talked to you, you would rub noses? It's usually the person who eats a lot of garlic and onions and doesn't own a toothbrush. <laughs> they love being in your personal space. And God says, I want yada. I want to be in that place with you where I'm close. I don't want to be out on the porch. I don't want to walk into the living room that you've got all cleaned up and perfect. I want to go straight into your kitchen. I want to pull out a chair and sit down at your table and say, let's talk. He wants yada. He wants the relationship, the mingling of souls with us. And many times when we're at the place where we feel like things are falling apart and we're questioning and we're pushing back on God, it's usually when he's trying to get inside that personal bubble. But it doesn't make sense to me. This isn't what I want. Sit down. Let's talk. Let's see what he has to say. Let's have the conversation. See, a relationship is listening to what they say reading God's word, and then having the conversation back. It's yada. Let's jump back into Luke chapter 7 in just a second. So here's this woman who's been talked about. She's not welcome. And usually prostitutes aren't the most respected people in the town. Yada is the last thing on someone's mind when they're picking up a prostitute. She probably knew a bunch of men, but she didn't know any of them, and they did not know her and yet in one brief instance she knew god she knew christ in a place of intimacy in a matter of minutes she had a relationship beyond what she had known with any other man it was yada so you can come to church and you can paste on the fake smile and you can know how to play the roles and you can know when to stand and sit and raise one hand or two hands or, or close your eyes and bow your heads. You can know how to go through the motions, but that's not yada. That's not loving God. That's not relationship. And what God wants with us 
is not for us to be a fan of him and go through the motions, but he's looking for followers of Christ who have intimacy. There's, a, there's an author by the name of Kyle Eidelman. He wrote a book called Not a Fan. And he gave three points, three things that he sees that fans of Jesus usually aim for. The first one, these are all on, on your outline. The first one is fans will choose knowledge. If I know more, I must more, be more spiritual. It's good to learn. Keep learning. But our relationship is not based purely on knowledge. Some fans will choose emotion. And if God touches your heart, if he touches your life, your emotions will be affected. But we can't let our emotions, our feelings, our wants drive our relationship with Christ. The third thing that fans will go after is position. Because if I'm higher up in the church, then I must be more spiritual. Fans will look for knowledge, emotion, and position. But followers will embrace intimacy and relationship. They'll dive in for intimacy and relationship with Christ. Let's pick up our reading. Luke chapter 7 at verse 44. It says, Then he, referring to Jesus, turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus stands, turns, and addresses this woman, which means he would have turned his back on the host of the party, which is a sign of disrespect. He says, you see this woman? This is where my attention is. This is where my focus is. She has poured out love. She has been in a place of intimacy with me. You, you just opened the door. You've been grilling me ever since. She wants to know me. It's Yada. She knew the Savior at this point. So what does this look like at Spring Lake? What does that look like for us as a church as we talk about loving? And I want to start by saying this. Loving does not happen one hour on Sunday mornings. Loving does not happen from 1030 to 1130. We may do that corporately at this time, but loving in worship and in prayer happens throughout our week. It happens in the ministries we have. That's why when we talked about our, our groups um, and, and the DNA of our group's prayer is one of those core DNA. It's one of the things we want in everything that we do throughout the week, even in our, our, our student and children's ministries. Brady has been working with, with Pam and Ryan, and we're now seeing how can we thread worship through, uh, through the events and the services for our students, that they can begin worshiping th themselves in a relationship with Christ. It's not just a one hour on Sunday, but how do we do this? How do we see it happen as a church? Here's the first thing we'll do. We'll set an environment for worship, and we will do it well. We will set an environment for worship, and we will do it well. We want the service to be conducive for worship, not a negative in regard to worship. When we see this woman coming to Jesus, it says she brings this alabaster jar, alabaster box of perfume, there's been so many studies done on this. That jar, that box was worth years, years of income. Our worship, our loving of God is costly. It is not convenient. We want to set an environment where we bring him our best. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. We want to do services well. Now, growing up as I did, there were some churches that I were in where they would have the time of worship and it would be something like this. Sister Jean, I see you're in church today. Why don't you come up here and sing a song? Sister Jean gets up, picks up a guitar, maybe in tune, may not, and she'd be tapping the mic. Is this thing on? Ooh, feedback, they haven't practiced anything. She'd say, you know, I haven't sung in a while and, uh, you know, I don't really feel that well, but this is for the Lord like it's the best they had to offer. And the challenge is, can we do something well as we prepare to enter God's presence? Can we do something well and can we bring to him 
be something that is costly for us, that is worth something for us. Secondly, we will worship God and not style. We will worship God and not style. Some people, they are all about what's hot and new. The only music, the only thing they hear is what's hot and new. Other people are what's traditional. What did I grow up on? What do I already know? And somewhere in the middle of that is a balance. We're not here to worship a style. We're here to worship God. God says he's looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. One theologian put it this way in regard to newer music that was coming up. He said, we must change up the tune or we will get stuck in the dance of the past. I want to read that again. We must change up the tune or we will get stuck in the dance of the past. This quote comes from the 1500s. It's always a challenge within the church, the worship wars that go on. Can we agree that we probably all won't agree on one style? Can we just agree to that? Let's not make it about music. Let's make it about worshiping God. When I was younger, and some of you have been around the church for a while, if you think all the way back to the 80s, there was this singer by the name of Keith Green. Anybody remember Keith Green? Okay. Keith Green wrote a song. It was called the Easter Song. Here are the bells ringing. They're singing that you can be born again. Okay, great song in the 80s. My dad rolled that out on an Easter Sunday. New song, Easter Song. He received hate mail. <laughs> this song isn't in the, in the hymnal, therefore it's not in the Bible. It was horrible. This, and those of you who know the song, straight out of Scripture. Now, fast forward a decade, and we did a different song on Easter. Those same people who were complaining 10 years earlier are now going, wait, where's the Easter song? We get, what, we get into a place of what we're comfortable with. We can fall into a style instead of a heart of worship. We, war, we will worship God and not style. This woman coming to Christ did not follow the protocol. She did not do it the way everyone else had done it. And I'll tell you this, when you don't do it the way everyone else has done it, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it can be sticky. Sometimes it can be awkward. But we don't worship a style. We worship God. Thirdly, prayer and worship start well before you arrive at church. Our relationship, our loving God, our prayer and worship should start well before we arrive at church. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6 talks about the personal relationship we're supposed to have with Christ. It doesn't start when we arrive here. This is more like the pinnacle of a time of worshiping together. You don't eat once a week. We can't spend our relationship with God in a box of one time a week. Have some time with Christ on your own, outside of this building, in loving him, in worship, and in prayer. And there are so many ways. Now, if you've got Pandora, if you've got Spotify, if you've got Google Play, you can go and you can look up the songs you like. You can look up maybe the style that's comfortable for you and have your own little personal Jesus time, your own personal worship service. Start it before you arrive. This woman walking into this presence, being at Christ's feet, she had that box with her. She had that perfume with her. She had planned it out in advance. She was ready to meet Christ. That's the challenge for us before Sunday or Saturday night ever arrives. And finally, prayer and worship don't happen from the platform. It happens from our hearts. Prayer and worship don't happen from a platform. It happens from our heart. Matthew 15, Jesus gives a warning out to some very religious people. And he says, you worship all nice on the outside, but on the inside in your heart, it's like it's full of dead men's bones. It's a grave. It doesn't happen from the platform. It happens from our hearts. And I want to close with this thought. You look up here and you'll see different people and you're like, oh, there's Tina. Tina's on the worship team this week. And oh, there's Mike. Mike's playing guitar on the worship team. Hi, Mike. You know, and you look up here and you think, I'm seeing the worship team. This is not the worship team. This is the worship team. They lead us in skill of instrument and of voice, 
but we are the worship team, and there is only one in the audience, and that's Christ. We are the worship team, and you may be here for the first time, or you may still be checking things out. I want to welcome you to the Spring Lake Church worship team. You may not be able to carry a tune in a bucket, but you're a part of the worship team. We worship Christ. He's the only audience that we see. So when you come in on a Sunday morning and you're like, I wonder if I'm going to like the worship team this week. I don't know. Do you? (laughs) We are the worship team. We are called to worship an audience of one. As a matter of fact, can you just turn to the person beside you and say, I love serving on the worship team with you. Life happens fast. Life is busy. There's so much to sidetrack us. There's so much that is easy to just numb our brains with. It's so easy to check out. But can we challenge ourselves, challenge each other to find that place of intimacy, of of yada, with God in our own times? Can we challenge ourselves as we enter and worship together to make it a, a, a relationship and a time of loving God from the core of our heart.